Thank you, Dr. Delahose, for having me and inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, this talk really kind of came about <clears throat> from a conversation uh, Dr. Delahose and I were having a, a while ago um, about different types of cases uh, we were seeing, um, and that inspired me to kind of delve deeper into this topic and look at the current uh, research um, and uh, other policy around this topic. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, learning objectives is I hope at the conclusion of this activity, you'll be able to identify how age-related changes <clears throat> may impact work performance and describe the challenges of addressing fitness to duty in the aging position. So I have a case here, an illustration. I've changed all the names and identifying details. Uh, but Dr. X is an 80-year-old, well-established physician with a long tenure at their institution. They were referred by their supervisor who noted that the physician's performance were troubling in two specific instances. In instance number one, there was a, a slide read as benign, which uh, there was challenged by the Dr. X's supervisor, and it was later found out to be a type of malignant cancer. Shortly thereafter, there was another instance in which Dr. X read a slide of the benign hyperplasia um, and a different colleague then questioned the findings. And again, on review of the slide, it was found to be a type of malignant cancer. <clears throat> so, you know, we are in the midst of a national conversation about aging in the workplace. Um, this is made clear by the frequent comments about even our two presidential candidates, 181 and 177 in which the conversation is about their age. And because of their age, you know, there's questions about, you know, their ability to do their job. Um, that somehow age denotes frailty or incompetence or weakness. But what many of you may not realize is that this conversation is taking place around physicians as well. What is an older worker anyway? Well, if you go with our legal colleagues, um, they may define an older worker as age 40 and over, and that's really based on the Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967, which prohibits uh, discrim employers from, discrim from discriminating uh, against workers age 40 or older. But if you're like me, which is, you know, over that age group, then you would say that 40 is way too young to define an older worker. So then you can look to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics for a definition, and they define an older worker as those age 55 years and older. Um, some of you, though, who may fall into that age group feel that maybe that's still too young. Uh, and so the Pew Research Center defines an older worker as those age 65 years or older. Um, NIOSH kind of throws up his hands and says there's no consensus on the age at which workers are considered older workers. But in general, most of the research studies, um, you know, you, you find older worker defined as age 55 to 65 years of age. <clears throat> According to the Department of Labor and Bureau Statistics, older Americans are working longer and spending more time on the job than their peers in previous years. In 2000, there were approximately 4 million Americans age 65 years and, work, or and older working. By 2016, that is that blossomed to 9 million individuals age 65 years are working. And it is projected that by this year, there will be about 13 million um, Americans who are age 65 years, age of, age of 65 years of age and older working. So why do we have this trend? Um, number one, there's been an increase uh, in the life expectancy in the United States. Um, back in 1900, the average year of life expectancy for males was 48.3 uh, and 51.1 for females. By 20, 2008, that had grown to 75.3 for males as well as 81.1 for females. At the same time, there's been a decline in fertility rates, um, and that results in fewer younger workers entering the workforce. What this means then is that the population is aging. Um, so back in, this graphic shows the U.S. population back in 1900, in which you had um, a larger proportion of younger people, um, uh, you know, in the population, and it progressively got, you know, uh, less as you went up. 
so it was more of a pyramid shape, if you will. They project that by 2050, there will be a rectangularization of the population curve such that you'll have an almost equal number of older uh, people in the population as younger people. Um, and that will lead to older workers being in the workforce more because they, um, they, um, their life expectancy is longer. What this means for the workforce is that the new workforce model will be multi-generational, in which you'll have five generations uh, of people working together, um, people from the baby boomers, the traditionalists before them, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z. Um, and so you have people working together which have different frames of reference. Um, people born you know, around the time of the Great Depression uh, all the way to people you know, whose frame of, re of reference is the, the Great Recession. <clears throat> the impact of this multi-generational workforce is that those who work longer have to endure the effects of aging as it relates to work. And the challenge will be for their employers to keep them healthy and safe and productive. Um, NIOSH has recognized this and they've done a lot of work around this um, starting about 15, 20 years ago where they, they have a National Center for Productive Aging and Work and they advocate for productive aging across the work life. This uh, includes a supportive work culture for any multi-generational issues as well as addressing the needs of older workers in the workplace. Employers who don't anticipate the physical and the cognitive capacities of older workers really do their work as a disservice um, by failing to provide any programs or policies which may help to keep older workers in the workplace. Um, as a result, you know, workplace productivity may suffer, they, they may impact the quality, um, as well as workplace safety. So what are the effects of aging and how may they affect the ability to return to, to work in the workplace? Well, one of the effects, as you can imagine, are chronic disease. Older workers have a higher overall rate of chronic disease. They incur greater, greater medical care costs and they have a higher likelihood of disability than younger workers. Older workers tend to have a slower recovery after a non-fatal job-related uh, injury or illness, and therefore they have greater delays in return to work. Workers aged 55 years or older report that their most you know, prevalent types of chronic disease are hypertension and hyperdemia, hyperlipidemia, again, not a surprise, um, and also 10 to 30 percent of workers have heart conditions, diabetes, psychiatric problems, and cancer, which may impact their ability to work. In terms of musculoskeletal conditions, um, there are 47 percent of workers age 55 years or older that report higher rates of musculoskeletal conditions like arthritis. Uh, and some of the age-related effects on musculoskeletal system is that individuals experience alteration in balance that increases their risk for falls. There's a decrease in muscle strength due to muscle fiber atrophy. There's a diminished physical capacity and decreased manual dexterity. Cognition is also affected uh, by age in which, um, you know, cognition is just the mental processes requiring, you know, spatial abilities, problem solving, processing of complex stimuli. And that is also affected by age, in which you have a decreased processing speed um, and decreased working memory or your short-term memory. You have an increased difficulty uh, inhibiting irrelevant information. And as a result, you're more influenced by the order in which you receive information. There's reduced hearing, there's reduced vis visual acuity and visual spatial ability. Physicians are not immune to these changes. Uh, and so as the workforce over all ages, that includes the physician workforce. Well, what does this mean in terms of numbers? Well, the American Medical Association reported that in 1975, there were over 50,000 practicing physicians age 65 years or older. But by 2013, that had risen to over 241,000. In 2019, the AAMC reported that you nearly know, half of the physicians were at retirement age or approaching retirement age in the next de decade. 
So 27% of physicians were between the ages of 55 and 64, and 15% of physicians were more than 65 years, uh, age, years at old. The Federation of State Medical Boards released a study uh, in which they looked at the age of physicians uh, from 2010 to 2022, which is not a you know long time span. But what they basically found is that the age of the younger physicians are either flat or decreasing, but the physicians aged 60 years of age or older has dramatically increased. Um, and they said it was about a 54% increase um, in, in the age of physicians aged 60 years and older from 2010 to 2022. So, physicians in the workplace, you know, like any other workplace, uh, seems to be getting older. Um, and there are, these comport very much uh, physical as well as cognitive changes with aging. So, do we just assume that because the physicians age, there is a cognitive decline? And more importantly, that that cognitive decline affects their ability to return to work or to, to remain at work in the workplace? There were studies done on this topic, Powell and Whitlock, which were two researchers at Harvard, um, looked at this to very topic. And if you look at the left graph, <clears throat> they, they studied 1,002 physicians, um, 581 controlled participants, which were non-physicians. Um, of the 1,002 physicians, uh, 356 of those were age old, age 65 years or older. And what they found is that there was an age-related related difference in their cognitive scores. So both physicians as well as the control group experienced a cognitive uh, decline in, as, as it related to the scores. Um, and uh, they found that of the 356 physicians who were aged 65 years or older, that that cognitive impairment was, was globally on all the cognitive scores. Um, and 46% of them had deficits in more than one cognitive domain. Now, if you look at the graphic on the right, what they also found is that with increase in age, that there is an increase in the variability of the scores, such that you can have the same age physician at age 75 um, and one of them is cognitively intact, whereas the other one shows evidence of, you know, cognitive impairment. They also did studies on physicians' age versus performance. Um, and they did find, and a lot of these studies are mostly within the surgeon, uh, you know, anesthesiology population. But they found a higher mortality rate for cardiovascular procedures performed by older surgeons. There was another study which looked at, um, you know, <clears throat> mortality following pancreatectomy, and they found that surgeons aged 50 to, four, to 41 to 50 years in age had a lower operative mortality than those aged 60 or older. So those aged 60 or older had a higher operative mortality than those younger physicians. Um, although, you know, they did discuss that that might have been due, uh, due to the low uh, operative volumes of those surgeons. Canada had a study in which they showed that um, anesthesiology were uh, not only sued more often than the younger colleagues, but they were, uh, you know, 1.5 times um, the risk of being found responsible in litigation than their colleagues who were younger than they were. In a more recent study, which came out just last year in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, um, the authors did an observational study using a sample of Medicare patients aged 65 to 89, uh, and they, treated, they were treated by emergency room physicians from 2016 to 2017. The endpoint was the seven-day mortality um, after emergency room visits, specifically stratified by the age of the physician. They observed over 2.6 million ED visits, um, and they were treated by over 3,200 uh, different ED physicians. They adjusted for patient and physician characteristics, as well as any hospital effects. 
And what they found, uh, if I could point your attention to this column here, is that for those uh, physicians uh, less than age 40, their adjusted seven-day mortality was 1.33. Uh, for physicians age 40 to 49, the adjusted seven-day mortality was 1.36. For 50 to 59, the adjusted age seven-day mortality was 1.4. Uh, and for those age 60, it was 1.43. So these differences were found to be statistically significant. And when they modeled age on a continuous linear variable, for each 10-year increase in emergency room physician age, there was a 0.04% higher seven-day mortality. And if you look at this column here, there so is said, a point 0.11 difference um, in adjusted seven-day mortality between those physicians age 60 or older and those uh, less than 40. Uh, and what they found is that this 0.11 percentage point difference corresponded to one death per 909 uh, emergency room patients. They also looked at different endpoints, such as patient disposition, you know, whether or not a patient was admitted versus discharged, um, as well as severity of illness, and they found similar effects due to physician age. So what do we do now? Um, there are increasing, you know, studies coming out showing, um, you know, that there is cognitive decline within the physician population, um, as well as some studies, as I just pointed out, that suggest that there are age, uh, you know, uh, related effects on patient outcomes. Um, so there's increasing public pressure to address this issue um, and ensure that healthcare professionals are still able to perform their jobs. Some have called for a mandatory retirement of physicians. And the, what they, they use as a model for this is they point to other safety sensitive functions, say safety sensitive industries in which um, you know, they have mandatory retirement for those uh, professions. For example, the FAA, um, they have a mandatory retirement of age 65 years or, or you know, 65 years in which no commercial pilot um, can fly. And any pilot over age 40 must undergo a periodic health assessment um, every six months, uh, which is half of the renewal interval for the younger pilot. Um, 33 states and the District of Columbia have mandatory retirement ages for judges, although there is no mandatory retirement age for judges on the federal level. Um, there's also a federal, uh, separation of service um, for, for, um, for professions such as air traffic controllers, FBI employees, and other law enforcement uh, officials and firefighters. And they vary in ages from age 57 to 65. If you look briefly to other countries, China, Finland, India, Ireland, Japan, they require their surgeons to retire by age 60 to 68. Britain's National Health Service had a mandatory retirement for physicians, however, they eliminated this rule. Um, and similar countries in Europe also uh, lifted this rule. Austria, Canada, and the United States do not enforce the age-based retirement for physicians, although that doesn't preclude individual institutions on practicing from practices from instituting their own policy. And in fact, Duke University physicians practice, they had a mandatory retirement age of 70, but they removed this in 2016. And part of that is due to, you know, the pushback to mandatory retirement uh, for physicians. Because you, as you can imagine, this leads to <clears throat> a lot of questions and pushback and resistance. Um, one of the you know, reasons for, for this uh, pushback is based on the data that I've already showed you, which that the relationship between physician competence and age shows a lot of individual level variability. You know, as I pointed out in the example, 75, if you could be age 75 years of age or older, and that could mean that you have perfect in, perfectly intact competence versus another physician who's age 75 who may experience cognitive decline. 
So it was very difficult to have a mandatory one size fits all policy for retirement when you have that many, that much age uh, level variability. The other concern with having a mandatory retirement policy for physicians is that there is a concern about what that might do on the physician workforce. As we all know that there are many uh, rural or other underserved areas which have shortages of physicians. And the concern is that implementing a mandatory retirement policy would affect you know, those, uh, shortage, those areas of physician shortage. Another concern um, is the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, as I've mentioned before. Uh, it's a labor law which for forbids employment and discrimination against those age 40 years of age of older 40 years of age or older, uh, and that includes any um, employment decisions around firing or retirement and things like that. There is a carve out in the ADE e Day Act for um, for safety for people in safety sensitive functions, but that doesn't stop people from litigating anyway, and that is a concern around any sort of policies um, about mandatory retirement. And then another reason that you know, there is pushback against mandatory retirement for physicians is that, as I mentioned, there's a, uh, NIOSH has uh, a whole uh, Center for Productive, Productive Aging, um, and then as older workers are remaining in the workforce longer and the new workforce model being multi-generational, it's really up to employers to anticipate the you know, physical as well as cognitive capacities of older workers and make adjustments for them. And so any sort of policy around mandatory retirement is inconsistent with supporting a workforce participation amongst all aging people. <clears throat> so there have been those that have proposed voluntary self-reporting, you know, saying that physicians, you know, they know, you know, maybe when their skills are declining and they will voluntarily report that or, you know, voluntarily remove themselves from the work environment. Well, they've done studies around that as well, um, and they indicate that physicians are vulnerable to what's called the illusionary superiority bias effect. So they tend to overestimate their current abilities. Another study uh, done that says when physicians do become aware of a compromising condition, they're resistant to self-report for fear of professional, societal, and legal sanctions. <clears throat> when they've looked at a survey, of, a, of about a thousand surgeons, 58% indicated they would retire if they noticed a decline in their surgical ability. But the same sample, 32%, said that they would continue to operate despite noting a decline in their abilities. <clears throat> so then you might say, well, what about you know peer reporting? We could maybe rely on the physician's peers to report. They've done studies on that as well. Uh, and when a colleague observes a cognitive decline, there's a reluctance or unawareness to report this to their supervisors or any oversight body. Over a third of physicians um, did not completely agree that it was even their professional responsibility to import, report impaired colleagues, whereas another third felt very unprepared for dealing with such colleagues. And studies suggest that while peer review may be able to grossly detect variant outcomes, you know, outcomes like death or infection, they were not able to detect substandard outcomes. So things like, you know, maybe you know, less pain control um, or less restoration of patient function that could have been possible uh, and things like that. The JAMA article came out in 2017 that kind of sums up the, the thoughts on voluntary, um, uh, you know, physicians voluntarily reporting. Uh, and it says, if enacting a mandatory retirement age goes too far, purely voluntary policies for assessing physicians' ability to practice safely as they age do not go far enough. Voluntary approaches have the virtue of political feasibility at the institutional and national level but share the fatal flaw of relying either on physicians to self-refer or clinicians to report an aging colleague to such programs. Despite physicians' commitments to professionalism, compelling data suggests neither is likely. I found that very interesting that they put that out there. So 
expecting physicians to voluntarily self-report or report colleagues may not be the best solution. In the last several years, there have been various organizations which have come out issuing policy or recommendations uh, around this topic. In 2015, the California Public Protection and Physician Health Program recommended that institutions adopt a policy that applies to medical staff at a certain age. And they define that age as being the age by which studies have shown that there begins to be a cognitive decline. They also recommended peer assessment by colleagues, observations by others in the clinical setting, and an assessment of cognitive function in addition to um, history and physical screens for any mental health, emotional issues, substance abuse, and hearing and vision testing. The AMA Council on Medical Education also in 2015 suggested that um, there be episodic evaluations of physicians at, at, at about age 70 um, and should include neurocognitive testing. In January of 2016, um, the American College of Sur Surgeons recommended starting at age 60 to 60 plus, 70 years of age that surgeons undergo voluntary and confidential baseline physical exam, visual testing, and have regular reevaluations thereafter. They also recommended neurocog neurocognitive function uh, testing using online tools. Um, and they also um, asserted that it is a physician's professional ob obligation to disclose any concerning findings. In 2018, ACOG came out with a statement recommending also um, <clears throat> monitoring uh, based on your age um, with periodic self-screening of cognition and mental wellness um, validation tools. So these recommendations were all largely voluntary, um, and they depend on voluntary actions by physicians. Um, but in 2017, the JAMA article came out, and those authors were calling for a move from voluntary to more mandatory programs to assess the wellness and competence of physicians. They identified critical stakeholders in this process, uh, which are summarized in the table that you see on, <clears throat> on your right. Um, in which they call for individual physicians to voluntarily undergo annual physical exams um, and screenings similar to what the commercial airline industry does for its pilots. They also call on healthcare organizations to develop policies for mandatory testing at certain ages uh, and to strengthen the peer review process, which would allow for uh, more observations, um, as well as, you know, foster, you know, reporting uh, of, of colleagues. They also call in local medical societies to provide resources, support uh, for these endeavors. Um, they cite, you know, a lot of uh, states have medical societies um, specifically to address physician substance abuse, but they call for these societies to also expand their roles and address, um, you know, supporting physicians who may have cognitive difficulties in the workplace as well. Some organizations uh, appear to be taking heed of this because in 2019, the American Society of Surgical Chairs started advocating for mandatory cognitive and psychomotor testing of surgeons starting at age 65. Um, institutions are also um, taking heed of this. Um, and that there are a handful of institutions around the country uh, that you can see there, uh, which have instituted man mandatory physician health assessments once they reach a certain age. The University of Virginia requires that physicians undergo a health assessment starting at age 70, uh, which addresses both the physical and the mental capacity for whatever privileges are being requested. Uh, they provide their results to the practitioner's department uh, chair or the division chief. Um, and then once they reach age 75, they have to undergo these screenings every two years. In Nebraska's children's uh, program, uh, they require physicians to undergo the screening at age 70 um, and to undergo a peer assessment, uh, which, uh, you know, 
uh, includes also cognitive screening, um, and their uh, screening program is every two years. As you can imagine, there's been pushback, uh, you know, with a lot of this. Um, and Stanford, they had a uh, mandatory uh, screening component. However, their faculty protested. And in 2015, they withdrew cognitive screening as a component of their, their program. However, they then strengthened the peer review process and it now includes peer review, not only from colleagues, but also from, from nurses um, and other advanced practice professionals who may work with the, with the physician um, as well. Yale has a late career practitioner policy. Uh, however, this has been legally challenged, as some of you may be aware. Uh, the case is currently ongoing, but they did publish some findings in JAMA about their program. So their program has clinicians who are at least uh, seven years of age and seeking reemployment to the medical staff. Um, and their program includes not only physicians, but advanced practice providers. Uh, so they're assessed for their fitness to practice medicine, um, which includes a vision and a neuropsychological assessment. Uh, their screening consists of 16 brief tests, and it was developed by a neuropsychologist. The medical review committee determines whether their clinicians can practice independently. And what they found is that, and the study was done on 141 clinicians. And so they stratified them in four different groups, the results of this testing. Uh, you were either normal, and so if you were normal, you proceeded with your regular recredentialing process, and you were rescreened uh, every two years thereafter or you fell into the low global scores or relative weakness in one to two abilities uh, you know, category, in which case that you were able to proceed with your regular recredentialing and you were rescreened in one year instead of in two years. Now, if you fell into the category where you had weakness with possible implications for unsafe practices, uh, you were then um, asked to undergo a comprehensive neuropsychological examination. And if you had substantial defects in screening, then you had to undergo a comprehensive neuropsychiatric uh, psychological evaluation, or you were directly evaluated by your ability to practice medicine. Now, the amount of people who fell into the normal category was 81. So it was 81 provide, uh, providers who fell into the normal category. Uh, for the low global scores and relative weakness abilities, there were 34 people who fell into this category. Uh, and for the, the third category, uh, there were seven clinicians who fell into this category. Of the seven physicians who fell into this category, uh, four were eventually cleared to continue work, to continue the recredentialing process. Three, though, had significant problems and ended up resigning or uh, retired. Uh, in the fourth bucket, uh, you had 18 physicians, uh, or clinicians, rather, um, who fell into this category. Um, six clinicians ended up retiring, and 12 were uh, limited in, uh, in their scope of practice. Um, so <clears throat> those results are interesting. So unlike, you know, Yale or any of the other programs that I mentioned, most institutions do not have a formal policy in place. Um, and it used to be that some of this was decided behind closed doors, either on medical boards or physician wellness uh, committees or maybe executive committees of hospitals. But as I mentioned before, um, more and more of this is coming into public awareness. Um, and so there, there is a, a the possibility that more and more of us will be called to evaluate our, co our colleagues, uh, particularly occupational medicine providers, neurologists, psychiatrists, those people will likely be at the forefront of um, doing these evaluations, uh, as well as, you know, have a hand in providing policy. So in the absence of a formal policy, what does really this evaluation look like? Um, 
and most of us are usually called to evaluate somebody with, uh, you know, who, have, who has already de demonstrated some sort of cognitive decline. But, you know, ideally we should be doing screening, you know, on those who are preclinical. Um, so when you do a cognitive screen and test, uh, the purpose is to identify preclinical cases. It should be quick, non-invasive, low cost, and you want something that's highly sensitive. And once you screen, you may go on to administer multiple cognitive tests based on your initial findings. This is just a, you know, a modified chart that I took from one of the articles that I reviewed, but it demonstrates you know, some of the different types of cognitive screens that are out there. Most of you may be most familiar with the MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, and um, you know, because of that familiarity, it's probably not the best test to test other physicians. Um, you know, if you look at this line here where it talks about the novelty for physicians, um, that really means, uh, you know, is it as familiar for physicians? Because if physicians are the ones administering this test, often, then they know what the test is, they know all the answers, therefore it's not really novel for the physicians and the physicians can beat the test, if you will. So in choosing a test for providers, <clears throat> you want to choose one which may not be as novel. Uh, to providers. Um, also, another critique of the MOCA is that although it does stratify by education, um, usually the education it stratifies by is, you know, college educated or not. And since physicians are, you know, above college ed educated um, and doctorate level, um, it really doesn't have as much utility um, in, in dis distinguishing, uh, you know, issues uh, for the higher educated population, such as physicians. Uh, another, you know, critique of the MOCA specifically for physicians is that there are no measures of your processing speed, which is one of the things as we talked about that declines um, as you age. It really just re um, measures your accuracy of responses. So, you know, whether or not you get the exam, the, the exam question right uh, on the MOCA but it doesn't really measure like the speed at which it took you to, to, to do that. The other ones are for you know, more specialized populations. The R bands or the repeatable battery for the assessment of neuropsychological status. Um, that's used mostly in the BA population. Um, so uh, physicians who, um, oh, I'm sorry, it, it, it's, it's <clears throat> Um, the SLUMS is the St. Louis University Mental Status Examination. That's the one that's used most for the VA population. So physicians who are um, uh, familiar or work in the VA population, that may not be the best test for them either because they um, are familiar with the test and that won't be novel to them. The microcog um, I mentioned before, um, that was developed by the researchers at Harvard. The uh, the advantages to that is that it's a computerized test, it does measure processing speed, um, and uh, it is not widely used by physicians, therefore it's novel to them, um, so they couldn't necessarily prep for the test beforehand, beforehand. The downside of it is that it requires a neuropsychologist to interpret the scores. Um, and you know, for me, when I when I saw this, I was also wondering about the mini mental status examination because <clears throat> that was the test I was more most familiar with in addition to the MOCA. Um, and interestingly, it seems that the mini mental status examination has kind of fallen out of favor. Um, it you know some of the critiques around it is that it lacks um, exploration of all the cognitive domains. Um, it again does not test processing speed. Um, it had copyright issues for a large number of years and has been largely removed from the public domain. So in most of the research the studies that I looked at um, that talked about the different measures of the test, uh, mini mental was only men mentioned passingly and uh, not really used uh, for, for at least the latest uh, research studies. So once you do the initial testing, uh, you usually refer for neuropsychological assessment. Uh, that involves a clinical interview, uh, review of 
of records and review of the test. This usually requires about several hours to complete. Um, it helps to though define the nature and the severity of the cognitive impairment. It aids in differential diagnosis and also informs treatment in it as any rehabilitation. This is usually done by a, by a neuropsychologist psycholo um, because it, you know, it requires knowledge of the appropriate test selection, administration, interpretation of the various tests, um, you know, consideration of any biopsychosocial factors, um, as well as you know, experiencing with, experience with appropriate recommendations for uh, based on the, the test exam findings. Um, they've done studies that looked uh, about uh, on the cognitive testing. Um, and so the studies, you know, basically show um, that they're, you know, using these cognitive tests, that they are able to measure a decline in physician performance. In this first study, they looked at 267 referred physicians. That means there was an issue why they were referred for testing. And they looked at 68 uh, physicians without professional concerns. Uh, the study that they, uh, the cognitive test that they used was the microcog. Uh, and they found that a larger proportion of physicians in the referred group obtained lower scores, uh, particularly around processing speed, processing accuracy, and cognitive proficiency. Uh, and that cognitive impairments were present in 24 to 26% of them. Uh, another study looked at the cognitive profiles of 39 urologists and uh, 30 uh, other physicians uh, via neuropsychological testing, and they basically found that of the referred um, you know, of the referred group, almost half of them, which is 14, met the criteria for impairment, and 86% of those were eventually diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, dementia, and Parkinson's. Um, some of the caveats to testing is that, you know, obviously screening tests are imperfect tools that can have unintended consequences. Um, obviously, you don't want false um, positive results um, in these sort of tests because that would require competent physicians to undergo unnecessary testing and, and um, understandably it leads to a lot of, you know, mental stress and stress around this, this issue. Um, the studies, uh, a lot of the studies lack comparable groups to interpret physician performance. Uh, you know, a lot of them were just looking at, you know, the referred group. There were very few studies looking at, um, you know, a non-referred group of healthy physicians to uh, a referred group of physicians. And so there needs to be more testing done comparing two groups of uh, physicians to be able to make comments on physician performance. Um, a lot of the control groups out there are not physicians, and then you, you wonder, well, who should the performance, the, uh, the results of the cognitive test be measured against? It should be measured against other, uh, you know, equivalent uh, groups of physicians without, without these issues. There's also the difficulty of defining impairment for physicians. Physicians, you know, understandably, they, they are, um, they perform higher on these tests than the normal population. They usually perform about one to two standard deviations above the, the norm for, for these sort of tests. So then what is really defined as impairment? Is it you know, a fall from their normal above standard um, performance? Um, and is that decline significant enough to impact their work performance? Those questions are still being, you know, asked and trying to, 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 to be determined. Um, the other caveats with these testing is that some of these changes are specialty specific. So for instance, if you're a surgeon, then obviously your visual spatial ability becomes more of a factor and any impairment in your visual spatial ability becomes more of a factor than if you're just you know, a psychiatrist. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, age-based screening may be subject to anti-discrimination laws. Um, and so that is something to keep in mind. Um, and there are racial, ethnic, cultural, and language factors which are not reflected in any of this testing um, or even in some of the interpretation of the testing. Uh, for example, um, language. 
um, many physicians come from other countries where their language is, the first language is not English. Um, and some of these tests require you know, language fluency. Uh, for example, one of the questions on the MOCA test is, you know, name as many, you know, uh, words as you can beginning with the letter X and you have a certain time frame in which to do so. So for the physician whose, language, whose first language is not English, they may score lower on this uh, portion of the test, but it doesn't mean that they're cognitively impaired. It's just that you know English may not be their first language, and they, they had some delay in pr producing words that start with the letter F. Uh, and so there should be some allowances for, for those sort of issues, um, and currently um, there isn't. So follow-up after testing. What do you do after you test? Um, and let's say the results come back and they're intermediate, or the physicians contest the findings. Well, the recommendation is that more extensive testing uh, should be undertaken, um, including uh, a clinical evaluation of their actual medical knowledge. Um, this can include things like you know, uh, clinical observation, um, medical record evaluation, <clears throat> um, and other peer feedback maybe from their colleagues or people that the physician works with. Um, Final decisions may be made by, you know, senior uh, clinicians, wellness committees, um, other clinicians with, uh, with expertise in the physician's specialty, um, or, you know, neutral third party. Now, if there are cognitive de deficits found, then the approach should be, you know, more um, concerned about, you know, how do we support the physicians in the space rather than something punitive. Um, the American Medical Association Council kind of, you know, sums it up by saying physicians should be allowed to remain in practice as long as patient safety is not endangered and that if needed, re remediation should be a supportive, ongoing, and proactive process. The thought is it should be similar to any other disability in which we would attempt to find um, some sort of accommodations if possible or, um, you know, um, some, some solution around this rather than, you know, immediately trying to dismiss the physician. So it is possible for a physician to perform below expectations on cognitive testing and then, but still co competently practice. Um, and it's up to us, you know, the occupational health professionals to kind of um, help to lead that determination. So what this might look like is this might look like greater oversight of the physician's practice. This might look like limiting the physician's practice. Maybe they can't perform clinically altogether, but they can still, you know, teach, um, you know, run small groups, you know, things like that, um, do administrative work, which would still keep them in the workforce, um, but not necessarily uh, put them in contact with patients. Um, and this is all in keeping with, you know, the whole, uh, you know, what Nayash was saying about, you know, keeping older workers in the workforce um, as much as we possibly can. So I'm going to, <clears throat> well, this is in conclusion, um, to wrap up. Occupational health physicians as well as neurologists, rehab uh, doctors, and neuropsychologists have an active role to play in um, considering uh, assessing physicians and quite, quite honestly all uh, advanced practice providers uh, as they age in the workplace. Physicians should recognize their part to continually assess their own as well as colleagues' uh, physical and mental health. Uh, and although age is a strong risk factor for cognitive impairment, it is not the end all and be all. It is an imperfect predictor and many factors need to be taken into consideration. There needs to be more studies um, on comparable, comparable groups to interpret physician performance, um, and that neuropsychological tests should perhaps include specialty-specific components, uh, which would be more applicable to physicians of certain specialties. Uh, there's a few uh, institutions which have put out uh, competency-based evaluation guidelines, which can be looked to <clears throat> uh, for guidance on this issue. Um, and that the key thing is that employers, as well as medical societies, should provide supportive planning programs for career transition, retirement, or maybe even second careers for physicians um, in modified or cl clinical or non-clinical roles. And so just to 
sum up the case, you know, what happened to that physician? Well, they didn't show up for their evaluation, um, and I later found out the physician had decided to retire. But it does leave many questions unanswered. Could testing have revealed a specific diagnosis of cognitive defects? Could the physician have continued practicing with closer oversight? Or could the physician have then have, have, have gone on to <clears throat> maybe more teaching or academic functions, uh, mentoring and things like that? I'll have to leave you with those questions because I don't know the answer, but it does bring up a lot of food for thought 